Aloha, and welcome to the Matrix of Peace show hosted by Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleese, and the CEO of Peace Through Commerce. Our guests today, one is calling in from a village near Nazareth in Israel. She is Palestinian, and her name is Sylvia Margia, who serves as a co-director of the Peace Leadership Program at the Radical Aliveness Institute. Our second guest is Anne Bradney, who is the founder of the Radical Aliveness Institute. We are discussing decision-making with the Radical Aliveness process through the lens of the Matrix of Peace whole systems model of society. This is an approach that we introduced on November 3rd in our Matrix of Peace show with Sylvia's Israeli co-director, Nitsan Joy Gordon. In this show, we will be concentrating on achieving heart justice in Israel and Palestine. So to begin, aloha, Sylvia. Salam, Masal Khair, good evening. Oh, thank you. And Anne, aloha. Merhaba, and hello, and shalom, Phyllis. Okay. It's nice to be here. I'm very glad to have you. And Sylvia, I'd like to start with you and do a little check-in. You are now in Nazareth area. There is bombing going on around you, and it has been now for about 60 days. Would you just please check in with us and let us know what you're experiencing? I maybe I will just uh, uh, fix something small. The bombing, it's not around me, but it's like really nearby all over uh, and mostly and especially like in the southern of uh, Israel. So for me personally, in my um, closer environment, I feel safe, but uh, mostly feel um, pain uh, for all the people that now moving out of their homes because of this reality of war from the southern of Israel and from Gaza. So in a way, I feel that it's not in my on a closed circle, but definitely all around me and in my hometown. Yes. Yes. And we'll we'll talk more about that. So thank you so much for calling in and that I'm glad our connection is working. And I would uh Mike, if you'd call up slide one, I want to let the audience know that Sylvia Ann and co-director of the Peace Leadership Program, Nitsan Gordon, they are together introducing a program with Palestinian and Israeli men and women that began before the bombing, working on peace building, dialogue, and healing. And then when the bombing started, they continued the modules that you are delivering. And Anne, if you would, would you introduce for us what that program is. Yeah, thank you, Phyllis. Um, our program, the Radical Aliveness Peace Leadership Program, is a program that is working with leaders, people from the West Bank, all over Israel, uh, people from different perspectives, people from different backgrounds. And our intention is to use this process to raise awareness, to bring connection, and to help people make different choices around the conflict by being together, by knowing each other, by witnessing each other's pain, and by learning tools and skills that help them actually navigate the world very differently. Okay, and you told me you do, you prepare the curriculum and the homework and the content. And Sylvie, you and Nitsan are holding the group uh, for Anne when she's there and when she's not there and lead these groups in person. And could you speak a little bit to what your experience is 
With this program, as opposed to other forms of peace and reconciliation programs that you're aware of, how this is different, better in any way? Yeah, I think that um, one thing that it's the most important difference from other program, it's like to listen to the wisdom of the heart, <laughs> uh, where all of our feelings are in, and being willing to really be together with our all range of feelings and vulnerability in front of the other that mostly we will cut up out of our life in the crisis of conflict. So for me, it's like connected to the wisdom of the heart, uh, connect to the wisdom of the wounds, uh, to really, for me, what is like meaningful is that there is something very valuable in sharing our pain, our wounds, uh, and, and really access a new information, mm -hmm. which mostly we are not allowing ourselves to be present, especially in the middle of conflict, if it makes sense, like... Um, yeah, I, I think what you're saying, Sylvie, that feels so important is that the world is complex, conflict is complex, people are complex, and in this program, we're really challenging the binary good, bad, right, wrong narrative and holding a space for people to have their very powerful feelings. This includes rage and hate and everything, uh, in order to get to a deeper place of listening, hearing what's going on for other people, understanding the complexity of what each other is living, rather than buying into a very simplistic view of the world that the media and the powers that be want us to have. So it takes tremendous strength and courage. Um, and we have a very committed and willing group who's still saying we can't wait to get together. So let, let me just reframe for the audience. When you say we in the group, these are Israeli and Palestinian men and women that, and in the room will be Jews, Palestinian Christians, Palestinian Muslims, Palestinian Druze. Was and West Bank, and West Bank. Well, I, I okay. I thought I was so thinking about Arab Palestinian and Gaza and the West Bank. Not from Gaza, but okay. Um, but uh, there are Arabs, Palestinian Arabs, living in Israel. There are also yes. Palestinians living in the West Bank, and we have all of that in our program. So they bring in generations of conflict and pain. Yeah. We said in our last show, for those who want to go back and review it, that we're, we're trying to change the pattern that's been set and described by Richard Rohr around pain, which has not been transformed, is being transmitted generationally. And you want in this generation for this group to break that pattern and transform the pain so it is not transmitted. And then, and this is where I wanted to add who else might be in the room, then the decision makers around what to do in societies where we are all living will come together making new kinds of decisions about how to live together, how to, how to share values, how to cooperate with beliefs and stop solving problems with violence. And instead, Sylvie, you spoke about them drawing on new wisdom, the wisdom of the heart. Yeah. You know, I feel that sometimes in a conflict, the easiest or the pattern of going back to your, like to be one-sided. And I think that 
the heart have like much more room for new information than what we have in our mind. And I think that what is missing in our world is like balance in between our ability to digest information through our cognition, our mind, and mostly now being more like able to digest information through our heart. So for me, it's a completely different uh, way of, of uh, gaining information or study and, and really or different even being as a human being. I feel that we forgot that, uh, especially in the middle of conflict, just to like allow how we are saying, and like, uh, and now at those days, I'm feeling it more that really allowing my heart to feel, to break down, and being able to expand or, yes. or stretch. So, in a way, I feel it completely a different way, valuable way of, 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 of studying or, or gaining new information. Yeah, and what uh, there were a couple of things you said, Sylvie, that feel so important to say here, Phyllis, is that when we allow the feelings, the deep emotions that are so many times not allowed in other processes because people are afraid of them, we welcome them, we're not afraid of them, that those feelings open us in ways to a willingness to be with others and to take in new information, and then we can change our mind. And so we're using information that comes from this heart space to change our stories and as a whole group of human beings to walk into a different future together, which we cannot get to on our own. We have to do it together. We have to use the wisdom of the whole to create this new world and these new stories. And that is what we're doing in our program. That is how we're holding space. And that's what we're doing, creating a new narrative, creating a new hope for the future. One that hasn't been seen before, one that has not been seen. We have to do it together because the powers that be are going to create war and violence and use old stories to keep us separate. And we're really coming together. That's our intention. So one of my great intentions for this show is that we have the we being the decision makers at in the Knesset, in the Palestinian Authority, in the who the, the Hamas, in Congress, around the world, that they that this be required, a required process and practice before they open their mouths, that they learn how to come into union with the wisdom of their hearts before, you know, you said, Sylvie, human being before doing, you know, that's mm -hmm. what I wanted to say when you said that you who aren't a native, aren't a native English speaker. And you're reminding us that our, in our word, we begin as human beings and this process evolves that being. And, and opens us up to that, that unlimited heart space of wisdom, which I think needs to happen with every decision maker who's pulling a trigger, pushing a button, or sending people to war. And I think women need to be in the room at least 50% represented, if not more, to bring in not men and women gen genetically, but the, but the ethos and the feminine wisdom to be brought into the room alongside the, the male wisdom, that one not be dominating the other, even in terms of convening the decision makers and having their presence in the room. So that's my goal for this show, that it be seen by the UN, by decision makers, by the media, and by academia, in corporate boardrooms, 
of K-12 education, that everywhere that people are making decisions, either as voters or leaders, that they adopt this new way of being with the radical aliveness process. And so, Anne, we have a couple slides here, and I want the audience to know, Anne's going to introduce with Sylvie some of the core principles at a very high level of what the framework is for getting into that room side by side with the other or in conflict. And then we're going to show a video of some of the on the ground work with the men and women who've allowed us to videotape some of this relationship emotion work. Then we're going to talk about it a little bit and connect some of the dots for you about decision making. So Anne and Mike, if Anne, could you start talking a little bit about the principles of the radical aliveness process? And we have some slides, but don't don't bring that up, Mike, until Anne calls for the first slide. Well, yeah, I'd love to see the principles there. And okay, go ahead. Then. About them. Um, radical aliveness, we say as a non-expert process. And what that means is that we don't have, we're acknowledging that everyone in the room is a leader. Everyone has wisdom. Everyone has information that's needed for us to move forward. So we're not teaching people a skill set that says, here's how you get to healing. And here's what healing looks like. And here's what the answers are. We're saying, we don't know. So the principles of radical aliveness, as for all of us are, we know we don't know. We're cultivating a non-shaming heart and attitude. And what this means to me is that we're welcoming everything that needs to come into the space to be held, understood, validated, transformed. We're willing to be changed by our encounters. This is a really important part of our work, that when we meet with others, they will expand us. We are coming from our own narrow perceptual filter, and the beauty of being with other human beings who we are different from is that we get new information and we get more awareness so this is also a big awareness growing process when we were preparing for this show that you were very clear with me and and i have done this work on the ground with you and with sylvie over the last 10 years and what what i'm invited to participate in is an emerging decision making process emerging wisdom. No one comes into the room with answers. No. They come in with their being, not even the no. questions yet. We're trying to discover what the answers are. Yes. And we do that in an emergent wisdom way. Yes. I and think new intelligence into the room. Sorry, go ahead. That's okay. No, but you were asking about the principles and, and the idea of the principles is that what is a what's a frame that can hold an emerging process? And so the principles are the foundation of our work and what guides us in how we hold this not knowing, this emergent process, all the different feelings and information that are present in everyone in the room. So the principles, which I already said, the other one is saying yes to everything, which yeah. means saying yes to everything within us with an intention for more awareness and consciousness. So not, not censoring anything that is coming up in us. And I can't read these, Phyllis. Okay, I, number one, a non-shaming heart attitude. I Have said we, that. Mm -hmm. And then knowing I don't know. Yep. And number three, welcoming multiple perspectives. So that one's very important. And I didn't say that yet. That 
the world is so complex. There is not one way of being. And a deep value of the work that we're doing is honoring different perspectives, just like we need biodiversity, we need a diversity of thoughts and ideas and perspectives, I believe, I think Sylvie does too, to walk into our future together. We need all this wisdom. There's not one way that's going to get us into a new future. So we welcome multiple perspectives. What else? Uh, for being willing to, to be changed. changed. I, I talked Say, about that. Saying yes to everything. Yes. Do Now, I don't know whether this is getting into your three principles for kind of the, the rules of being in the room together, but six is do no harm. And seven is do your part. Yeah, and so the do no harm, we know we're going to do harm because we keep, we're not going to be able to see people perfectly or understand people perfectly. But for me, that means as a vulnerable leader, I am willing to stay when you let me know that I've caused you harm. And I'm willing to listen to what you're bringing to me rather than be the leader that says, I have the answers and whatever happens in that more hierarchical space. And the do your part is about taking action, action in the world. So we're not about being in a room and just having this experience and it doesn't translate back out into our lives. We are always holding the awareness of the world and our lives and our ability when we change ourselves to go back out into our lives, into our families, into our communities and make a difference, do something different. Mm -hmm. Make a decision. Yeah, yeah. So we have three rules of engagement that I think the audience is going to see are very, very important. When we then show a short video of the work in the room that the men and women are doing, you want to talk? You want me to read them? Do you do you want to read them, Sylvie? Yeah. Uh, do you want to say something, Sylvie? Yeah. Say anything about the engagement rules or the principles. Yeah, I feel like it's like uh, mostly the most important. Maybe that uh, thing is like. Don't hurt yourself, <laughs> like in hurting yourself by physically. I think that sometimes we are confused about the the, the meaning of uh, hurting one another because sometimes when we are speaking, we might hurt feelings of others, or even others will hurt my feeling. But it's like about really not hurting physically one another. Um, Oh, it's so small, the writing. Don't, so you need to help yeah, us. You did it. You yes. did it. You said, don't yes. hurt yourself. Don't hurt another person. Yes. And the space also, just and space. And, and just not breaking things and just keep the space which holding the container they also feel a, as a safe space. And, and, and all other things are, as Anne says, are welcome. Like, it's really, we are welcoming it. You know, I feel like there is no other space, especially now, you know, when we hold a meeting for the group during this war, most of the reactions that we, the feedback that we got from people, that there is no other space that they can really bring their voices, especially at those days of war, because the experience is that you can't say anything and it's not safe to say anything or to bring your voice. So in a way, it's like for me and for some others, it's the only space that you can really feel free to do everything, to say everything, to feel everything, to scream it out, to show it out, to cry it out all the way as you are saying, Anne, and at the same time, just don't hurt one another and the space and yourself physically. So in a way, it's a large 
space to work in. Right. Well, we're going to show that in the audience. I've, I've experienced being in the room with what the audience is going to see. And I want to just say, I was sort of surprised to see Anne bring out bats uh, that you can put in your hand to, you know, really express your anger. There are blankets, there are rugs, there are tables to put between people. Physically, people need to, when they see this, to know no one's being physically hurt but they are witnessing or expressing how they feel about the conflict and about the pain mm -hmm. and for themselves. And in some cases, Anne and Sylvie, I heard the men and the women saying they were expressing the pain that they saw their grandparents feeling, their parents, their children. It, children. It's like the people in the room are channeling and expressing the rage, the anger, the hate, uh, on behalf of the, the village, the community, and Sylvie, and what's coming up for you today? What can you share with us, starting with you, Sylvie, uh, with this safe haven video of the work that was being done a few years ago? You know, maybe I would like to take advantage of this uh, platform, as you say, to speak to all the leaders. Yes. And imagine if we can really feel, I think that if each leader can feel, and I think that we will be more aware and more uh, sensitive about other suffering. So for me, like witnessing this video is a reminder to if each human being, each leader, each part of this conflict will have the safety to feel all these feelings, anger, even hatred and grief, I feel that we will not be able to harm other human beings. So for me, this video is a reminder for this truth of, uh, because you know, I'm just thinking about why, why I should feel like, why, why we should have the space to bring all this feeling and you know, I, uh, I'm all the time saying that uh, when I lost my brother, I became a better human being that really stands, feel more for other, uh, other human beings suffering. Like I don't want to witness any parent that losing his child because I can really connect to my own feeling or even like witnessing sister that is losing her brother. And, and, and I'm just thinking about that as a children, very early in our age, we learn to cut ourselves from our experience of feeling, of feeling, what is going on around us and within ourselves. And in a way, I feel that we are disconnected from our wisdom, which I'm talking about. And the more that I'm allowing myself to feel, I feel that I can be numb to other suffering. And I really wish that all these leaders will just have the courage to feel, because if they will do, I think that we can stop this conflict. I feel, I think, I know that this is the only way. So I will share maybe also that uh, earlier, I, I like I shared that safe heaven to me today, it's 
something new, like because of what is going on now. Like I heard a journalist that sharing her loss of the people from Gaza. And she said that now all these people that are getting killed are building a new heaven, a new city of Gaza in heaven. So in a way, I feel that we need the courage to feel. We need the courage to really, you know, I wish that we will not be one-sided that we can really feel for all human beings. I know that it's hard. I know, I know as a Palestinian living in Israel, how much it's hard to feel for everything, everybody. But I feel that this is the only way to create new reality. And there is no shortcut because it's hurting. It's hard to feel so much. It's really hard, especially in war. But this is the only way. And for me, that's what we are doing in Radical Aliveness, to feel safe and to feel everything and to feel safe, to feel for the other, because we can do it. I, I really feel that we can do it. I believe, I, I believe in human being and I believe in us as Israelis and Palestinians that we can feel for one another and stand together to stop it. Thank you, thank you, Sylvie. You are doing it. We saw you doing it. Yeah. And Anne, what's coming up for you? You're on mute. When I listen to Sylvie, um, I I feel right there with her, and and so committed to this process because my experience is that when people have the opportunity, when they get in rooms with other people, when they feel what they have to feel when they have the space for this this radical space for feeling these kinds of feelings and being witness to each other that they are changed you can't go back out and look at the other as not a human being and so for me when we get people together in rooms like this what i see is that a certain kind of connection happens in a certain kind of um, willingness to see each other and be together in new ways. And it, it's I, I find that people are so excited and so hopeful when they're given this opportunity to say, oh my God, I never met a Palestinian. I never met a Jew. I never knew that you felt the way I feel. I never knew that I could love you. I never knew, really, these are the words people are saying. Never knew that I could love you and reach out to you in the middle of a war. So for me, this is a miracle that this group is, as Sylvie said, having the courage, it, whatever we've been taught, that feeling is weakness, that vulnerability is weakness, I am here to say that is not the truth. It takes tremendous courage to feel the depth of our feelings and to be willing to be with others in the depth of their feelings. And when our hearts open to that level of feeling and pain, what happens often is the whole room will eventually end up in their deepest pain with each other, looking at each other, bombs falling outside and getting together and singing a song together while the bombs are falling. I mean, it's it's like being in the presence of miracles nonstop. So I hope we're making sense. You you make sense to me. And and it's interesting you have this 
group already started and had you met twice before the bombing and then and you flew to Israel after the bombing started? No, no. Um, we had met twice and then Sylvia and I and my husband were in Sinai when the bomb bombing happened and Sylvia and I came back to Israel and we just stayed and worked with lots of people and we had a Zoom meeting with our group and I'm going back in January and I've spoken to a lot of people in the group who are so hopeful and excited about meeting again and yeah. so we have a we have a group of people that are saying this is the only place I feel hope you know like it's a it's a hopeful space and people are wanting to continue and so it, it kind of speaks to the power of this work that we met twice that we only met twice before the war and that people are still saying when are we going to be together i can't wait you the know palestinian and jewish members of the group yeah our group our group wants to be together. Our group is speaking to each other. Our group is wanting to find ways to meet in the middle of this war. So that tells you something, right? Oh, it does. Mm -hmm. And and I'd like to connect some dots here from the state building level of where your work fits on a model that we have created at Peace Through Commerce of a society. And if we can take a look at slide five, Mike, this, if we were to diagram a society, we think that this model does an incredibly powerful job of taking a complex system like human beings living together in societies and converting it into a useful model to re to keep us anchored to where true north is, to where we stand, and where the gap is between separation and intersection and peace. And what I what the the audience is seeing here is a simple Venn diagram with comprised of the typical three circles make up the three sectors of any society, no matter what, what level, whether they're at barter and trade or whether it's a complex commercial, capitalistic or communistic uh, economic system in the private sector at the top, there's always a government. We call that the public sector shown in the blue circle. And there's always civil society shown uh, in the uh, aqua or uh, the peach colored circle. So those are the three basic sectors of every society. And when they work intersect, when they work together, they can co-create what you'll see here as prosperity when the private sector is getting the right kind of laws and support from government, it can create long-term prosperity. But prosperity alone does not lead to peace. Money alone does not. So shifting to the bot to the bottom intersection, when the public sector is modified, that's our governments, that is our that is our even our terrorist leaders, any who's ever in this the position of making the rules for society, when the civil society sector is able to keep them honest and fair. We call that the intersection of the public and civil society sectors. You can see there, the intersection gets to justice. So you can have laws, but they may not be just. When the civil society sector has a voice, human rights and civil rights, then you get into the intersection of justice. And we say that that's good, but it's not enough. You can throw money at peace, you can throw laws and justice at peace, but we still have not experienced long-term peace, even in areas of relative quiet, without sustainable behaviors, sustainable practices. And that's where we move up to the third intersection, as you can see, between more, it, it's 
showing up as the intersection of the private sector behaving responsibly towards its employees, its team members, and the planet. And that's where the civil society sector keeps the corporations honest. That allows capitalism to operate as my colleagues at Conscious Capitalism like to say, as conscious capitalists, you don't need to throw the baby out of capitalism with, and with the bathwater of bad actors. You could, we can move into consciousness, and that leads to sustainability. And this model suggests that when you have prosperity and justice and sustainable behavior in everyday life, you can then support the middle supra intersection of sustainable peace. And so there's a model. And there's something I haven't talked about yet. That's the yellow globe around it all. And we call that the consciousness sphere. And that makes up both the peaceful feelings as well as hate and anger. And as in order to shift society from the outside sectors into the intersections, we need peace supporting behavior, feelings, values, and beliefs. And that's where we pinpoint where the work you're doing at Radical Aliveness Institute and also, Sylvie, you're working with Together Beyond Words. Well, let's go to the, without that work, we've got something like slide six. Without the consciousness work, we have, in the case of Israel and Palestine, each one thinking it won, it won, it's having a grabbing a piece of earth. And what happens to earth? It's blown up. And yet, with your work, maybe we could let me take it, move into slide seven. We can see how there are differences today in how Israel is working at, in terms of modeling. We can see Israel has active public, private, and civil society sectors. It's enjoying a certain level of prosperity, justice, and sustainability, where in Gaza and in parts of the West Bank, those sectors are still not intersecting. They need the support. And you can see there that from a modeling standpoint, they're living within the consciousness sphere, but they're not enjoying intersectionality. And let's move to the next slide. This is where the work that you're doing on the ground in consciousness, you're growing, you're developing empathy, listening, trust, and shifting at least the public sector governments of Israel and Palestine. Hopefully, we could have them shifting into a consciousness of heart justice so that Palestine can move into heart justice with Israel. And they can together find ways to create prosperity and sustainability for both societies. They can work intersectionally. And by the way, Congress, the United States is sending money into the area. Other, all other countries are sending money into the area. And yet there is not a balance between Israel and Palestine's enjoyment of justice, heart justice and prosperity. It, it, and, and let's make clear that the government doesn't represent all the people <laughs> on sure. either sides. Yes. I mean, and we feel a sense of powerlessness when people unprepared in a wholehearted, whole, whole consciousness way, they're, they're struggling to make decisions without a full deck, I would say. And that's a, the vernacular of the U.S., Sylvie. Um, not working with the full deck, not not accessing their heart wisdom, and and just to draw, I would like we have about six minutes. We have a few minutes we could share of how the people coming out of your radical aliveness process feel when they've done it. It's just three minutes. We're going to take a quick look because it makes the point of how change making this process is not for just the people in the room, but for it would we can believe that our decision makers would be as transformed.
I've been to many therapeutic workshops and many Jewish Arabic meetings. And this meeting has been right at the top at both categories. It's been amazing. The, the group of people that got together and the facilitation, the work that has been done, I'm, I've really been touched. It's way beyond my expectations. Thank you. This workshop for me, the interesting and the good part was that even though we were in the, the room, different people, people who believe different things, people who see the world in a different way, we found that it was possible to talk to each other. I was fascinated to see how people realize that they don't want to hurt other people. And from that location, by the fact that we saw like took off all the outside stories and went down to the essence of the pain. People listened to the essence of the pain of the others, really tried to connect to it, and could create a space, a, a place, in which we tried very hard not to add to that pain. And talking um, as an Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it was fascinating to see Zionists, um, Palestinians, being able to respect each other, respect each other's needs, and wishing, wishing to respect those needs, and without having to agree on the story. And that for me was really special. <laughs> אולי, אולי בגלל, בגלל החברה שאני באה ממנה, אז למרות שבמשפחה באמת יש, אבא שלי רגיש, אח שלי גם, אבל להרגיש את זה ממש, זה, זה כל כך עשה לי, לא יודעת, לחשוב עוד פעם, לחשוב לפני אפילו להגיד משהו לגבר, להגיד, טוב, הוא לא מתרגש. באמת, מסתבר שיש גברים רגישים, ורגישים מאוד. כאילו ראיתי דברים שפשוט, על דברים שאולי אני לא ממש התרגשתם, הורידו דמעות וזה, זה מדהים. זה מדהים ל, ל, לגעת ברגש של כל אחד שהיה כאן, אישה וגבר. And I wonder, is there anything that we have just maybe 30 seconds left that you want to, that's been left unsaid to this point? Sylvie. For me, there is the inner call um, for all uh, Israelis and Palestinians. to ask all of us like to step out of the illusion of separation. One thing I learned through my life, that it's illusion, we are not separated. And, and I really feel that now we need to step into this new uh, space that we are not separated and my Peace is bonded with your peace. And this is the only truth that we need as a survival need, as human beings, to, to understand. Thank, thank you, Sylvie. It is life and death. I so appreciate it. And Anne, I'm going to have to leave it there. I think you spoke for all of us, Sylvie. Thank you. To the audience. You have been watching The Matrix of Peace show at Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleese, the CEO of Peace Through Commerce. With me today have been Sylvie Margia, a co-director of the Peace Leadership Program at the Radical Aliveness Institute, working out of Israel, and our guest, Anne Bradney, the founder of the... Re Radical Aliveness Institute, and we have been exploring how to access heart justice through radical aliveness. Mahalo, Sylvie and Anne, for joining us, and mahalo to our viewers. Come back 
for our next show. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleeth. Aloha.